One of the main goals of the Saudi Green Initiative is to restore 40 million hectares of land and turn the desert green during the coming decades. National research is now being conducted to create the strategy for growing 10 billion trees. Afforestation or planting trees helps minimize sandstorms, fight desertification, and decrease temperatures in nearby areas. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you like this video, click the thumbs up button, click the bell icon to get notifications about our upcoming videos. The vast 2 million square kilometers that make up Saudi Arabia make it the 14th largest nation in terms of land area. Sadly, the majority of the country is a scorching, arid desert with a ton of sand. Additionally, it is one of the rare nations without even a single permanent river. Additionally, the country you are looking at has a year-round average yearly rainfall of less than 150 millimeters. But if you enlarge the country, you'll discover something completely unexpected. Arable Land The Saudi Ministry of Petroleum served as OPEC's mascot for many years, setting the standard for crude oil pricing and ensuring that vehicles, ships, and the world economy all ran smoothly. The kingdom's pivotal position as a top producer on the world stage was highlighted by the 1973 oil crisis. The confusion among market observers over the ministry's renaming to the Ministry of Energy in May 2019 was understandable given that the ministry's very headquarters is shaped like an oil barrel. Though local policymakers have long argued that their desert environments could serve as solar energy centers, the paradigm shift necessary to make this happen has always appeared unachievable until now. Saudi Arabia may have many sand dunes, but things weren't always like that. Around 10,000 years ago, Arabia had a major increase in rainfall as well as an extension of lakes and flora that allowed for the habitation of the entire peninsula. However, a string of severe droughts in the centuries that followed brought about significant environmental alterations. The sand land would still be inhabited by humans after they had evolved. Evidence suggests that there was human habitation at the Juba Oasis throughout the Dark Millennium, a dry era that lasted from roughly 5,900 to 5,300 years ago and is supposed to have rendered much of Arabia uninhabitable. In other parts of northern Arabia, people built walls around oasis, created structures in the environment to catch water flow, and dug wells. Although Saudi Arabia lacks surface water resources, it is surrounded by underground water reserves or aquifers similar to how the monarchy is situated above enormous reserves of crude oil. But Saudi Arabia has long been extracting water from the earth. Large-scale irrigation has allowed for the growing and harvesting of crops in agriculture, which has received the majority of the water. Pumping water from underneath the ground does have one drawback. Aquifers may go dry, especially if they are used for extensive irrigation like Saudi Arabia has done. The Middle East Green Initiative and the Saudi Green Initiative, both of which were unveiled this week, seek to bring together nations in the region that are dealing with comparable environmental issues. Approximately 40 million hectares of a degraded land are intended to be restored through the world's largest afforestation project, which is part of the plans. The program has garnered a lot of worldwide attention because it calls for the planting of an astounding 10 billion trees in the country alone and a goal for the nation to produce 50% of its energy from renewable sources by 2030. The UN and the UK praised the Saudi statement as being timely considering the global climate change agenda and positive considering that environmental issues have mostly been neglected regionally. This year, Glasgow, Scotland will serve as a host country for the UN's COP26 climate change conference. The Arabian Peninsula's residents' lifestyles were drastically changed by oil. In just a few decades, it brought about millennia's worth of economic growth, rescuing people from squalor and disease. However, the most important impact of this miracle on the environment has been the region's enormous population expansion, which has exacerbated climate change. The Arabian Gulf region is clearly at risk from the consequences of increasing sea temperatures as it's a shallow pool of water within such a hot desert. Low-lying coastal communities in Gulf and Red Sea countries are particularly susceptible to sea level rise. Desalination initiatives to supply water to major urban areas have harmed the local environment and use a staggering amount of energy. In this announcement this week, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman underlined the causes of desertification, dust storms, and air pollution. These causes include increased use of machinery, the expansion of heavy industries, and the tar marking of seasonal streams. The ancient way of life for humans without central air is becoming a distant memory because summer temperatures in some regions can reach up to 60 degrees Celsius. With global peak oil demand having either already occurred or scheduled to occur within the next few years, the time has come to focus on alternative energy sources. Although the kingdom as well as its neighboring countries have relied heavily on hydrocarbons to keep them cool and hydrated, their abundance has resulted in a number of glaringly ineffective practices. 
About the kingdom has the potential to harness the wind power of its mountainous regions, solar energy will be the most practical option. To continue to be effective and dependable, this will need to be done on a wide scale and updated frequently. The issue facing the UK in the next nine years is enormous, given that only Iceland and Norway, which do have notably milder temperatures, now source more than 50% of their main energy from renewable sources. Saudi Arabia introduced a technique to conserve water, and it has greatly improved things. The technology is irrigation using a center pivot. Where did center pivot irrigation originate from, and what does it do? The center pivot irrigation system was created in 1948 by a pioneering Nebraska farmer named Frank Zyback. It was patented in 1952. Utilizing an automated irrigation system, center pivot irrigation entails keeping a concentric circle around a central pivot to irrigate crops. The main component is a substantial radial pipe that's held up by sprinkler towers. The core of the entire mechanism is where these towers pivot. The radial pipe itself has nozzles that are evenly spaced out to water the nearby crops. To provide the crops with nutrition, the water is properly released from the nozzles as the pipe slowly turns. The water flows down the field in a straight path when center pivot irrigation is used, thanks to the radial pipe system. The flow rate and the area covered by each pipe nozzle are the same. This makes it easier to guarantee that the water being supplied to the crops is uniform. Depending on the length of tubing attached, center pivot irrigation systems can cover up to 130 acres in a straight system and approximately 155 acres in a swing arm system. The technique is appropriate for extensive cultivation. For center pivot irrigation, there are many different parts of the controlled panels currently available. Farmers can choose between basic and complex digital panels depending on their needs and budget. The drive tower, also known as the drive unit, is another portion of the machinery that contacts the ground. It houses the supporting hardware required to move the system. Wheels, a base beam, a drivetrain, and other significant structural supports are typically included. The drive unit is also controlled by the tower box, which moves the entire piece of equipment in the appropriate direction and for the requisite period of time. Farmers may simply administer water equally over a large area using center pivot irrigation. Additionally, it significantly minimizes the amount of work required during the harvest. This addresses two issues, the high cost of labor and the irregularity of farm workers. In the long run, this irrigation technique aids in tremendous energy conservation. Additionally, it is well known to use water much more effectively. It aids in preventing water runoff and guarantees that farmers' water expenses are significantly decreased. Additionally, this technology makes it simpler for farmers to control the water content of their soil. Farmers can more easily manage water levels because of the semi-automatic character of this mechanism and the lateral movement of the sprinklers. The effectiveness of water application in center pivot irrigation is seen to be close to 80%, which is significantly higher than that of conventional techniques. The administration then invented Harvard University bioethicist and futurist Mona Hamdi and Stanford University permaculturist Neil Spackman to try to undo the change. From 2010 to 2018, Spackman resided in al with the locals. In order to collect rainfall, he created rock terraces, check dams, and open swales in the ground. To control seasonal flooding and teach the water to flow as beneficial streams, Pacman and Hamdi employed Old Incan and Nabataean water conservation techniques. In 2012, the effort shifted to growing drought-tolerant trees, and by 2015, Pacman and the Bedouin had planted 4,004 plants of 10 different types. The majority of the trees perished, but enough thrived to offer some hope. When the funds dried up, problems would arise and the project would be shelved for a while. But the trees replanted themselves when it rained again. Maybe one day Saudi Arabia will duplicate al Bayada's success and the entire country will be covered with lush vegetation. Do you think of any other ideas on how to turn Arabia's desert into a wild forest? Comment below with your thoughts on Saudi Arabia's decision to plant vegetation in the middle of a desert. Also, don't forget to like this video.